All right, what's your questions? And you'll see you'll see that on some of the older exams. So you'll see if I start, let's say I started with um, let's say I started with one form with one of the enantiomers of two bromo. Uh, sorry, 2-chlorobutane, and said, you know, write the mechanism of this or show the products of this. If I said show the products of this, what I would expect you to do is to show the inversion of configuration of the chiral center. Okay, so if this was just a problem of writing the products, you would have to recognize that this is a secondary plus a strong nucleophile, which would make this mechanism SN2. Since it's starting as a chiral molecule, that means you're going to get inversion of configuration. And the way you would write the product, um, you would just have to basically write the opposite enantiomer of this. Now you could look at this and say, well, okay, this is four in the back, one, two, and three. So this is the S configuration to start with. So all you would need to do is to write is to write the R configuration. Basically for the final product, if you put the OH here, then you would just need to reverse while well, interchange the CH3 and the ethyl group. And now that's the R configuration. So I would check to make sure that the product has inverted its configuration. So I would ask you to I would ask you to do that for the product. Now if it was a mechanisms question, you have to show the stereochemistry in the mechanism. And so the way you would do that is you would have the OH minus come in, attack the carbon and kick out the chlorine. If my mechanisms questions are 15 points each, which they usually are, you haven't seen them yet, but you will. If you look at the old exams, that's my standard. I don't try and fit everything to a 100-point exam because then it's like two points, a half a point, a third of a point. I can't, I can't deal with that. So I deal in whole numbers. And that's why each exam is a, a percentage towards your final score. Um, and I know if I'm getting up into 200 points that it's going to be tough to finish. So I've been doing this a long time. That's, you know, if you go, why you're giving like 180 points? Because well, I don't keep track of points. I just make things standard. But I digress. If this is a mechanisms question, those two arrows are worth five points. Right, I'll talk in terms that everybody understands and values. So you have to include those arrows. So then the transition state would look like this. You would have the OH partially bonded to the carbon, partially bonded to the chlorine. So the OH is, is basically coming down this line. So all I'm doing is I'm taking that and I'm just kind of rotating it a little bit to make it horizontal. The CH2 CH3 is on a bond in the plane. The bold is the CH3, and the dashed wedge is the H. So when you're doing an SN2 reaction with a chiral molecule, you have to keep the stereochemistry in the transition state. So whatever the, whatever the orientation is, you've got to keep it that way. The carbon in the plane with the chlorine, 
in the plane with the ethyl group and then the methyl towards and the hydrogen away. You need your charges. Then when the final product forms, the final product has the OH bonded to the carbon in the plane because it's replacing the chlorine, but the chlorine, it's not on the right-hand side, it's now on the left-hand side. And then you still have your bold CH3, and you still have your dashed hydrogen. So going from, going from here to the transition state to the final product, that's how you would write the mechanism for a chiral molecule undergoing SN2. So I will check the final configuration. And so if the final configuration didn't change, if it's still S, then there's a small, then there's a half deduction there. Basically, this is worth five, this is worth, the transition state's worth five, and the final product's worth five. So if you have the wrong configuration here, you get two and a half instead of five. Because this is the backside attack. This is the way this is the way the nucleophile attacks the carbon from the backside. So what happens is is that when your nucleophile all the positions are pointing towards the nucleophile when it comes into the carbon. And as it as it approaches, these bonds flatten out. So that in the transition state when the nucleophile is partially attached and the leaving group is partially attached, those bonds, that's trigonal bipyramidal. So they flattened out. Then when the chloride leaves, the bonds end up going to the opposite side. So that's the inversion where it goes from this orientation to the other orientation. And that's because of the backside attack. Ashton? So SN2 always has the backside attack? Yes. That's one of the characteristics. So there were a whole bunch of characteristics, I think, at the end of a chapter or there were end of my slides. Backside attack is the mechanism for SN2. What is the top? Which one? This one and this, this one? Yeah. The the difference is that if I asked you to write the entire mechanism, you might you you might do it this way and get the product with the OH then on the left. If I just said, hey, write the final product with no mechanism, you wouldn't have to go through the me you wouldn't have to go through the mechanism. So you might say, okay, I know I'm going to undergo inversion, so let me just write the product with the R configuration. These two are the same configuration, but well, all I did here was, if I wanted to quickly write the R configuration, I would just replace the chlorine with the OH, which is what I'm doing, and then I would switch the ethyl and the methyl group, which then inverts the configuration. So the top one is just... The top one is just yeah, the top one is just if you had the right product. That might be what you write. You might write it like the bottom one if you see the mechanism in your head and say, okay, well, the OH is going to be on the left and everything flipped over to the right-hand side. What I'm looking for is the right product, which means the chlorine and the OH have been substituted and the configuration is opposite of what it started with. That's what I'm looking for. Alex. Um, so should the um, mechanism be written like then as the one in the product? It's just the right product? It could be. It could be. Or, like I said, starting with this configuration, what I know is I've got to replace the CL with the OH, and I've got to have an R configuration. So that's how I could quickly write it. They're all the same. It's just in the mechanism, it, it, it shows up like this because that's how the mechanism makes it go. 
go for optical activity. So, okay. Was was everybody okay with? And you'll see many of those problems in the older exams. Remember the older exams that you're going to be looking at. If you want to practice, well, if you want to practice, you'll have to get some scissors and cut and paste yourself a new exam. But the older exams are number twos and number ones. So in the number two exam, replace the free radical halogenation stuff. And if you look at it and go, I don't know what that is. Well, I mean, it could be stuff that we know that you don't know what it is, but most likely if it's reaction of chlorine or bromine, we haven't done that. We're replacing that with Newman's and chairs. And those were in exam one. So, so as far as optical activity goes, what we know is that if we have, if we have a pair of enantiomers, we know that one is D and one is L. One rotates plane polarized light to the right clockwise and one rotates counterclockwise to the left. We know that they rotate by the same number of degrees. So the specific rotation of the D enantiomer equals minus the specific rotation of the L enantiomer. They rotate by the same number of degrees but in opposite directions. And we know that if you have an unequal, if you have an unequal mixture of enantiomers, then you will get a non-zero specific rotation. If you look at some of the older exams, the question, bless you, the question that I sometimes will ask is, when will you end up with a zero degree specific rotation? I know what you're getting at, Ben. So, so what do we call that? What do we call an equal mixture of enantiomers? A racemic mixture. So the first place is when you'd have a racemic mixture. I think that's what you're getting at, right? So that's number one. When else would you end up with a zero degree rotation? Starts with M. Meso. If you have a meso compound, that will not rotate plane polarized light. And then third.
there's no chiral centers of the molecule. If there's no chiral centers in the molecule, there's no ability to have a mirror image that's non-superimposable. Your mirror image is superimposable. And that's the case for meso as well. Meso compounds are superimposable on their mirror image. It's just that they happen to contain chiral centers. And any, any molecule or any object with a mirror plane of symmetry through it will automatically be superimposable on its mirror image. So the key to being optically active is that you're not superimposable on your mirror image. And if it's a mixture of components, it has to be a non or it has to be a non-50-50 mixture in order to get a rotation. Okay, hold on. Diastereomers have what's what's different about diastereomers in terms of their chemical and physical properties? They have different physical properties. And what about their chemical properties? They're also different. So they have different physical and different chemical properties. And the reason is because diastereomers are a different molecule. They're different molecules. So they have different chemical properties. They have different physical properties. Now those properties might be pretty similar, but they're, they're not bound to be the same the way enantiomers are. So when we have an antiomers, what about their physical properties? Except they're the same except what? What physical properties different for an antiomers? Yes. But when we talk about physical properties, we don't necessarily talk about structures. That's how their structures are different. When we're talking about physical properties, we're talking about things like boiling point, melting point. What's different about an antimers? Why do I have D and L? They interact with plane polarized light differently. That's the difference in their physical properties. One rotates positively, one rotates negatively. So that's the physical property difference. What about the chemical property difference? When will an antimers act? When will they have the same chemical properties and when will they have different chemical properties? We need a hint. 
Let me dip her when I have the opposite. Well, sometimes the R and the S or sometimes the D and the L react differently and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they react the same. So the question is when do they react the same and when do they react differently? My hint would be to go all the way back to the beginning when I introduced this topic. And I talked about hands and lab gloves. Is it just like other and you can't be super So that's what the enantiomers are. But when when does that cause them to react differently? And when do they react the same? Um, they react the same when they react to other Okay, so let's stop there. So when the so when I'm reacting with a non-chiral molecule, when I'm reacting with a molecule that does not exist in a D or L form, then they're going to react the same. That's the example of me being able to put a lab glove on either hand because the lab glove is a chiral because the lab the lab glove is not chiral so then when will they react differently when they're reacting with another chiral molecule And the examples there are the things like we talked about, well, like I introduced the idea of chiral drugs. The only reason to make a chiral drug, to make the drug in one form or the other, is because the biomolecules in your body that it's going to react with are themselves in one chiral form. If they weren't in one chiral form, chiral drugs would be useless. So when you take something like, well, like the thalidomide, where the one enantiomer reacted with one, reacted one way um, with that chiral molecule, it reacted differently with the other chiral molecule. In one case caused birth defects, in the other case caused sedative. It was a sedative. Or um, when you smell, you can have two molecules, you can have the same molecule I did. The, I talked about the linalool from from our research, but the same thing can be said for um, a molecule called carvone, which either smells like dill or caraway seeds. So that one enantiomer, it smells like caraway seeds, and the other, it smells like dill. That means that the enzymes in our nose or whatever the receptors are in our nose are chiral so that, that molecule, those two different enantiomers react differently with those receptors. <coughs> and we perceive them differently. Same thing would be true if you had two molecules. That those molecules might taste differently. But then again, smell is a lot of taste, too. So they have the same physical properties, or same chemical properties when they're reacting with something that's not chiral, but when you're reacting with something that's chiral, they can have different, phys different chemical properties that can react differently. Does that make sense? Now, if you go back enough, you'll find those questions. I'm, you probably had those questions in this, in the top hat, homework and reading as well. I mean, they're hitting the same stuff I am. There's really nothing. There's nothing new, although people will say, 
I don't know where you pulled that question out of. Because to me, it's like it's the same test over and over and over again. I have to try and be creative, but there's only so much creativity that I have, particularly at this point in the semester. But it still doesn't, but still, it's like, I don't know where that came from. The rate equation for SN2? All right, I, you tell me. For an SN2 reaction, the rate equals what? Melanie? Both to the what power? Both to the first power. So the reason it's an SN2 reaction is because it's bimolecular kinetics. So that means the overall rate order here, the overall rate order is equal to 1 plus 1, which is 2, the sum of the exponents. So what does that mean in terms of doubling the rate of, or doubling the concentration of nucleophile? Double the concentration of nucleophile and what happens to the rate? It doubles. Make the nucleophile stronger, and what happens to the rate? Faster, slower, same. Faster. Why? Because the nucleophile is part of the rate equation. It's part of the rate determining step. Whereas, what is it for SN1? K times concentration of? How about the nucleophile? No. Concentration of the alkyl halide. The nucleophile does not show up in the rate determining step, or does not show up in the rate equation. Why? Because it's not part of the rate determining step. reaction goes fastest. A or B? Now let's do this. So which, the question is which one's going to go faster, A, B, or if they go at the same rate, C. Once I get the right class in here. So... So A, which one, which one's faster, A or B, or they're the same rate, C?
Has everybody answered? Is there anybody who hasn't answered because you're something won't connect or okay because this is what I use for participation points for, so for some reason your your thing is and you gotta let me know so I can write it down so when I go back through the participation points if you're not there you get participation points because you were here and then you have to participate by me asking you what your answer would be which kind of violates the anonymity but Okay, it's like my counting skills must be off. Okay, A is faster than B, 197. Okay. Let me ask a series of questions. If I gave you one of these problems on the exam, and there's other exams with these kinds of problems, What's the first step in answering it? What do you need to know? I need to know mechanism. So what's the mechanism for this reaction? SN. Hold up a one or a two. This one's SN. See, this is why we use this is why we use anonymous things because that. Uh, it's SN1. Why? Good question. Why? Why? Kristen? So I've got a tertiary halide plus a weak nucleophile, and I've got a secondary halide plus a weak nucleophile. So that means that both mechanisms are SN1. Now, that chart is important. But let's say you forget the chart. You look at the nucleophile and say weak nucleophiles. Weak nucleophiles can only do what mechanism? One. Weak nucleophiles can only react with the carbocation. So therefore they can only react with the one in a one mechanism. So this is SN1. So when I look at SN1, what reacts fast? Well, then the next step is to do what? See the point of difference. So I got tertiary versus secondary in SN1. Which one reacts faster? Tertiary reacts faster. Why? Katie? Okay, it forms a more stable carbocation. How does that make the reaction go faster? You can continue if you want. Um, or you can ask for help. Intermediate. So the tertiary carbocation is, is the more stable intermediate. And? Okay, so when I've got a tertiary carbocation, it's got a lower activation energy because of who? Who's postulate? Hammond's postulate says that the more stable the intermediate, the lower the activation energy, or at least our interpretation of Hammond's postulate. And if I have a lower activation energy, then what? The reaction goes faster because of Ashton, Swedish chemist. Starts with a the Arrhenius equation. So, because I have a lower activation energy, the Arrhenius equation says that the reaction goes faster. Okay. Now, the reason I went through the entire sequence of logic here is because the last time I asked you to go through that entire sequence of logic, it may have been too early, like on exam one, the last question. But now that we've talked about this a little bit more, 
if you went back and looked at that problem, and the problem wasn't exactly the same, but it did have a tertiary carbocation versus a primary carbocation in the rate determining step. When you form the more stable intermediate, you're going to form it faster because it's more stable. The Hammond's postulate says that it's going to have a lower activation energy. With a lower activation energy, the Arrhenius equation says it's going to form faster. But all of those are essential elements that you're forming a more stable intermediate in the rate determining step. And then through Hammond and through Arrhenius equation. So usually I don't like to ask that sort of an essay question, although I did for the last exam. So I took a bullet on that one to grade it. So I could very well ask you something like that again to see how we've progressed since the first test where that was kind of, you know, we hadn't gone over it fully to now where hopefully if you go back and look at that question that it kind of makes sense. So, yeah, so vinyl, hal vinyl halides are in, were in my PowerPoint slot. They, they do not, they do not undergo SN2 or SN1. Vinyl means, this is a vinyl halide. A vinyl halide is when the, hal is when the halide's directly attached to a double bond. If I took this, if I take that methyl group away, well, let's see, that's ethylene chloride. I believe it's this one. That's polyvinyl, or that's uh, vinyl chloride is its name. All right, polyvinyl chloride is PVC. So when you have PVC tubing, it's this molecule that's reacted in a long chain. The vinyl term, right? Vinyl's coming back. But the 1980s stereos to play them on are not coming back. Unless you kept yours, like I did. Then that's what those that's what those albums are made of. And it's shocking that we're still that they still exist. But that's the vinyl, that's what the vinyl term comes from. And when you hear it, anything that's vinyl is made of that material just in a long chain. So it's all got alkyl halide in it. But it does not undergo SN2 or SN1. Same thing's true for a benzene ring. No SN1 or SN2. Now, we're going to talk about this later, but when I put the chloride next to a double bond, if the chlorine leaves, I end up with that. And you may remember that when we talked about those systems, it does have a resonance structure, so therefore it would be stable. And those are, I believe those are comparable to a tertiary. No. We're just going to deal with tertiary, secondaries, and primaries. But in the book, but in the book they talk about putting the plus charge next to a double bond and then writing the resonance structures. And we had talked about that, but we're just going to stick to, to tertiary, secondaries, and primaries. And we'll come back to this next semester. So with SN1, the reactivity is based on the stability of the carbocation that's formed. When we're talking about SN2, the reactivity is based on whether it's tertiary, secondary, or primary, 
but the reactivity is based on steric hindrance. So for SN2, when there's not a lot of steric hindrance, the reaction goes fast. When there is a lot of steric hindrance, the reaction doesn't go. So our so in terms of that chart again, primaries always SN2, tertiaries always SN1. Secondaries, well with a weak nucleophile, the weak nucleophile's gotta do SN1. With a strong nucleophile, it's gonna do SN2. And a weak nucleophile cannot react with the primary. That no reaction is the one that is kind of the oddball. So again, if you and and in the past I've actually what have I done? In the past I've I've actually had I've had the chart and people fill it out right away, and then they turn that in. And then I give them a chart to use for the exam. I have done that in the past. I don't know if I'll do it this time. But if you if you panic and you don't remember the chart, go back to the fundamental principles. One carbocation, two no carbocation. That's the basic of the method. That's the basics. What else? All right. So how do the so the so we have a an aprotic solvent and we have protic solvents. Aprotic solvent a protic solvent is means hydroxylic and an aprotic solvent means no hydroxyl group. So protics have OH groups and aprotics don't, or non-hydroxylics don't. So, which one do we focus on? Which one either speeds it up or slows it down? Hydroxylic, we agree? It's the hydroxylic ones are the ones that you need to focus on. What does it do to an SN1 mechanism? Speed it up, slow it down. Speed it up. What's it do to an SN2 reaction? Slows it down. What does the other solvent do? The opposite. Right. So instead of memorizing four things, you can be more efficient and just learn two. So why does it speed up an SN1 reaction? Because remember, what's the, the rate determining step in the SN1 reaction is to form anions. What does the OH group do to the anions? It solvates them better, which does what to them? makes them more stable. It makes the reaction faster. Why? Because now the products of that reaction, even though they're intermediates, the products of the reaction were more stable. Hammond's postulate says it has a lower activation energy. Arrhenius' equation says you form things faster with a lower activation energy because they form faster. It's the same stuff over and over again. But it's, that's the basic. That's the basic fundamentals that it, 
that if you can focus on those and you can think, and I know it's you know you're trying to get as many points as possible and finish the exam, but if you take a step and you go okay, let me go back to the basics here. The ions are solvated better. Anytime you can make the products more stable, it's going to push the equilibrium or it's going to make the reaction go faster. And then in SN2, what happens? In SN2 reaction, in an SN2 reaction, my anion is in the reactant. So do I want to make the reactant more stable? Making the reactant more stable is exactly the opposite of making the products more stable. You make the reactant more stable and what happens? It slows down the reaction. Okay. And how do you recognize a hydroxylic or a protic solvent? It's got an OH. If it's a solvent that doesn't have an OH, it's the other one. Okay. And I'll probably just stick to acetone or DMSO, which has the sulfur in the place of the carbon. Okay. So, are you going to have to write mechanisms? Yes. Are you going to have to do R and S configurations? Yes. Are you going to have to tell me the chemical or the relationships between molecules? Yes. Are you going to have to do Newman projections? Write the three Newman project or write the three clips, three staggered, rank them. Yes. Are you going to have to do chair conformations and tell me what's one, two, three, four, two cis, two trans, rank them from one to four. Yes. And then whatever I come up with on the side is the wild card. Okay. But if you take those two problems from exam one and the problems except, except free radical halogenation from exam two, you have this exam. Okay. All right. If you have any questions, email me. Um, I'll put this up on YouTube for this morning. I don't know what the afternoon class will ask, so if you go to the YouTube, you could probably take a quick look and see if they asked something different than you did, or and then they can vice versa. So, right. but if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Come and see me. Otherwise, I'll see you on Friday.